Stephen, welcome to Beyond the Inbox. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for finding the time in my ridiculously busy schedule. <laughs> I want to start by asking you a little bit about your background and how running barefoot at a friend's suggestion got you started in the footwear industry. Um, yes, it was the biggest mistake of my life, but here we go. So I, um, um, I got back into sprinting 15 or so years ago when I was 45 and I was getting injured constantly. I don't think I had more than a two week stretch of being uninjured and then something else would happen. And after a couple of years of this, uh, I was in Boulder, Colorado and Boulder is just full of world champion runners. And one of them suggested that a, I read the book born to run. Uh, and B, I try running barefoot to see if I learn anything. Well, I didn't have time to read the book because two days later, there was a guy doing a weekend class on barefoot running. Now, I'm a sprinter, okay? So I run the 100 meters outdoors. I run the 60 meters indoors. I don't even take turns on the track because I don't have a GPS watch, so I would get lost. So I, um, I, I'd never run more than a mile before, and I didn't enjoy anything after the first 200 yards of that. So we go on this first barefoot run with a group of about 20 people and I, and we're running on grass and on pavement and on sidewalks and on trails and on gravel and on wooden bridges. And I mean, just almost anything you could think of. And I was so enthralled by the experience and I was so curious. I was experimenting. I was changing my gait. I was like having, doing more steps per minute whilst running at the same speed or fewer steps per minute running at the same speed, or running faster or slower with the same number of steps per minute or landing on this part of my foot or that part of my foot. I mean, just, I was just so curious because it was so fascinating. And at the end of this run where we all just kind of stopped, I don't even know why I could have kept going. Somebody did have a GPS watch on. And I said, how far was that? And she said, that was a, about five and a half K. I went, sorry, what? I mean, I had no idea. Um, so that part amazed me that I was running for all that time and could have kept going. A couple minutes later, I'm getting my car and I notice I have a big blister on the ball of my left foot. Now, I have learned that the average human being in that situation will say, oh, see, this is ridiculous. It doesn't work. I got a blister. I, for some reason, went, huh, how come my right foot is fine? And oh, yeah, my left leg is the one that's getting injured more often with my two years worth of injuries. So that was interesting. A week later, we're doing another barefoot run. And I thought, okay, I still have a gaping hole in the ball of my left foot. But I figured if I could find a way to run that didn't hurt, then I probably wasn't doing the thing that caused the gaping hole to begin with. So I thought, all right, I'll give it 10 minutes. If it doesn't work, I'll either try it again after I'm fully healed, or maybe I won't try it at all. I don't know. We'll see. So nine minutes and 30 seconds of agony later, um, something just changed. And I'll tell you what it is in a second, but I didn't know then. But in that one moment, literally from one step to the next, my running got faster easier, lighter. My breathing was better and more relaxed. Everything was just working better. I was enjoying it on top of that. Now, uh, that never went away, that change. I mean, I was just aware of something and I just kept paying attention. And by the way, the way that change happened was the whole nine minutes and 30 seconds. I wasn't really trying to avoid the pain as much as I was paying attention to the good side going, so what's my right side doing that my left side isn't? And eventually the left side kind of figured it out. But um, what happened, what I realized is as a sprinter, you land on the ball of your foot. Well, I was overstriding. So I was reaching out and landing with my foot too far in front of my body and pointing my toes to land on my toes. So basically, I was just putting braking forces on the ball of my foot. And that's what caused the problem. So I, and also causing my injuries because that was a bad biomechanical position. So once I stopped uh, r running in regular shoes, my form changed. My injuries went away. I became faster. I'm a master's all-American sprinter. So for the last 15 years, um, I've been one of the fastest guys in America in my different age groups. There's five-year age groups and um, never changed. And so I wanted, I swear the story's coming to an end. I, I wanted that barefoot-like experience all the time, but I was getting tired of arguing with restaurants about whether it was legal to get into a restaurant barefoot. And my wife was getting tired of me coming home in my bare feet and walking on our white carpeting with my dirty bare feet. So I made a pair of sandals based on this 10,000 year old design idea. And um, people asked me to make some for them and for them and for them and for them. And finally, uh, the guy who ran that first barefoot running workshop that I did said, I have a book coming out 
about barefoot running. If you had a website for your little sandal making hobby, I mentioned it in the book. So I rush home and I pitch this incredible opportunity to my wife who assures me I'm a complete idiot and it's a bad idea and I shouldn't do it. And it was a waste of time. And by the way, don't do it. And if I didn't mention it before, don't do it. And so I told her I wouldn't build a website. And then she went to bed and I built a website. <laughs> and that was um, 13 and a half years ago. And happily, she has come along for the ride. Uh, and, uh, and, and here we are after starting out with a do-it-yourself barefoot sandal running kit. We now have 39 styles of casual and performance shoes, boots, and sandals that people all around the world use for everything from taking a walk to running ultra marathons to weightlifting to pickleball to, I mean, pretty much everything you can imagine. I have so many follow-up questions. One thing that stood out to me when I was listening to you tell your story was, were Vibram Five Fingers around this period? I wanted to ask you about that. Good question. They preceded it. So they came out in about 2006, and um, had they fit my feet, I would have never started the company, wow. but they didn't fit my feet. So I have Morton's toe, so my second toe is longer than my first, or more accurately, my first toe is shorter than my second. It's supposed to be the other way around. Um, and, uh, and so they never really fit my feet. And I tried them repeatedly. Like every six months, I'd go try them on. You know, like when it's late and you go to the refrigerator, you're looking for something and you don't find it. And then you go back five minutes later as if it's a psychic replicator. <laughs> you know? So I kept trying them on and they just never felt right. They never fit. And so here we are. That's so fascinating. I remember buying a pair many, many years ago and I was such a big Tim Ferriss fanboy that I bought a pair. And I remember some of the looks that I would get from people when I would be out and about. Oh, yeah. And if you're an introvert like me, it's a lot of unwanted attention. And yeah, moving on from that because- Well, I... well let's pause there. Let's pause there. Sure. We know from scientific research that the two most effective forms of birth control are Crocs and Five Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard to disagree with that, Stephen. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well, and I think this is a good segue into asking you more about the shoe. So you and I were talking during the pre-interview and you brought up something which I thought was fascinating. We were talking a little bit about the marketing for the brand and you said, and I quote, we have an ad that's running on YouTube. That's our most successful ad on YouTube for four years. And it's my favorite. Can you tell us about that ad, why it's been running so long, and why is it your favorite? Yeah. Um, well, the ad starts by me saying, uh, I don't wear comfortable shoes. I refuse to wear comfortable shoes, and you should. And, um, and then I go on to explain that what we typically think of as comfortable isn't actually beneficial or isn't actually even as comfortable as we think. So, for example, I'm just referring to regular shoes where, um, you know, there's all this foam and actually, I start, I think I might have even go in there by saying, look, there's things that we know that are, that taste good and we like that aren't good for us. It's the same thing with footwear. The fact that something feels good doesn't mean it's ultimately good for you. So you step on a bunch of cushioning, feels really good. But in terms of performance, it's actually not for two, oh, well, for more than two reasons. The biggest one is simply that you have more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and your lips. That's to tell your brain what you're stepping on or in. So your brain can then control the rest of your body to move you efficiently and effectively and enjoyably. Well, you can't feel anything through all that cushioning. Um, secondly, because your brain is trying to feel things, uh, it'll often make you land harder to try to get feedback, but the cushioning is slowing down the feedback, which makes you unstable. And the research shows, I mean, we think cushioning must be good because running is putting a lot of force into your body. Well, the research shows that the cushioning actually doesn't cushion. What it does is it spreads out the pressure so your feet don't feel as much, but the force is still going up into your body, typically into your joints, most specifically your knee first and then your hip and back after that. So uh, that's what the video is about. But one of the reasons that I like it, and it goes on, and it's, I've got a couple of versions of it, but it just talks us to the story about how comfort isn't necessarily providing the benefits that we expect. And, um, and real comfort is letting your body do what's natural letting your muscles, your ligaments and tendons be the springs and shock absorbers and joint protectors that they're made to be. And when you run properly, it's really not about footwear, it's about form. And you just, when you run barefoot, bad form hurts and good form feels good. It's the bottom line. And so when you're using your body naturally, it's really fun. Look, you can, I'm not suggesting people run barefoot, but you can spot a barefoot runner from 50 meters away. They have a weird look on their face, typically called um, smiling. 
And because it really is enjoyable when you do it well. Uh, so the other reason that I love the video is, of course, many people will either just read the title or listen to that first 10 seconds and then tell me what a moron I am. And I love just responding by saying, so which part of my argument do you disagree with? Do you disagree that stronger is better than weaker or that feeling things is better than being numb or that moving is better than being uh, constrained or that proper alignment is better than being out of, out of alignment? And if you don't disagree with any of those, then you agree with me. So why are we arguing? And they almost never respond to that. Um, and so, uh, and of course, last but not least, we've been running that for so long because it works because people respond to it. And the number of comments that we've gotten where people say, I've never watched a YouTube ad before. I just watched this one and I just bought your shoes. Uh, so put it all together. But the biggest thing for me is that because we are up against 50 years of shoe companies saying these things are good for you with a pointy toe box that squeezes your toes and an elevated heel that messes with your posture and a stiff thing that doesn't let your feet move and arch support that actually makes your feet weaker. Because when you support any joint, think about putting your arm in a cast, it gets weaker by not by being quote supported. Same thing with arch support. There's research that shows you can lose up to 17% of the muscle mass and strength in your foot in just 12 weeks if you have arch support. And that just works over time. Um, we've been convinced that these things are, if they're not good for you, they're benign, neither of which is true. And so I, our job in trying to get people to unbelieve things they've been taught for 50 years is by either being provocative to start the conversation or pointing out something where immediately people realize that their own experience undermines what they believe. So like my favorite thing is to stop, well, not stop people on the street, that'd be rude, but to just, you know, say to somebody, um, I look at the shape of their pointy toe box in your shoe and I go, is that the shape of your foot? And they go, what? I go, take off your shoe. Is that the shape of your foot? And they take off their shoe and it's like, no. Go, Why are you trying to shove a foot shaped thing called your foot into a not foot shaped thing called your shoe? And don't you think it'd be more comfortable if you could not have to do that? They go, yeah. I go, well, you know, that's what we do. I have a question here around your ideal buyer, and I think I'll run up to it like this. So you also told me in our pre-interview, and I love this, almost every product you've ever seen, whatever market <laughs> is based on one of two stories. Here's a better version yeah. of something you already understand, or here's something that's so obvious you can't believe no one thought of it. What story or stories are you telling or not telling? Zero shoes. Um. It goes back to those points that I made. Stronger is better than weaker. Um, feeling is better than not feeling. Being able to move is better than not move. Proper alignment is better than not being aligned. I leave out a couple of things like uh, balance is better than being unstable. And that comes from, you know, shoes that are higher. The higher you get, the tippier you become. And there's really nothing you can do about that. So the story that we're telling includes just these obvious things about how bodies work. I'm actually doing a presentation next week at the American College of Sports Medicine. And I'm going to say, you guys have all been lied to while this top, the topic of this is supposed to be how to pick the right shoe. This has nothing to do with footwear. This has to do with using your body the way it's designed to be used and whether footwear supports that or impedes that. That's what we're talking about. It's about natural motion, natural function, not about footwear. It's just that some footwear gets in the way of that and some footwear supports that. So the stories that we are telling uh, are all in that realm of, but trying to find interesting ways of doing it. Like one uh, intro that I do for a video, I say, do your feet feel better at the end of the day than they did at the beginning of the day? And no one ever says yes. And I go, well, if your answer is no, it's not your fault. It's not because of what big shoe has told you. It's because your feet are not being supported or more accurately, they're being constrained in the footwear that you're wearing all day, every day. All I can tell you, and I, I then say, I can show you why in a moment, but what I can tell you is we have over a million people who discovered that getting out of tr quote traditional running shoes, and they're only 50 years old, we're, you know, th that's the intervention, um, has allowed them to be comfortable, have improved performance, and have improved health in many, many ways for both of those. And so, and, and more, they're so lightweight and comfy. We've had people actually go to bed still wearing our shoes because they forgot they had them on. So if that's interesting, you know, here's where you can find out more info. So it's because you, you can't tell people they're wrong. People don't respond to that. You can't tell them, here's what you have to do. They don't respond well to that either. Um, you can't just say what we're doing is better 
because they'll just pick it apart with what they already believe that may not be true. And you can't even have some person who's like a celebrity or an expert say, or almost anyone say, you know, I thought the same thing you did, but I tried these and I love them and they changed my life and they'll do the same for you. Because then people go, yeah, but that's you. I'm not like you. So it's uh, the only way we can, uh, the only way you can address what someone believes and have the opportunity to get them to reconsider it is by as elegantly as possible, pointing out something where their own experience undermines what they believe. And maybe they will reconcile that cognitive dissonance by trying something different, by doing something new. And eventually, if they hear that often enough, that's when there's a kind of critical mass moment where there's enough awareness and there's enough questioning that people are really willing to try something. And the experience of trying our shoes is so profound when your toes aren't getting squeezed together, when your posture is not being messed up, when you can feel the ground safely. Because the experience is so profound, that's when things start to grow exponentially. And I would argue that we're not too far away from that. And I hope we're not too far away from that because I would love to see if we can change the world before I die. It's so fascinating to hear how you describe addressing these pre-existing beliefs and inviting the buyer to consider whether they're wrong. I'm curious, have you learned all this from experience or have certain marketers informed your thinking? I know you've been in the marketing game for a very long time, and I'm so curious how you've been able to consolidate all this knowledge and experience. Um, it's an interesting question. I, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I've been a, I was a psychology major in college. I've been interested in psychology since long before that. Um, I, my favorite things to read for fun are cognitive psychology textbooks. Um, and, and, and in the cognitive psychology and social psychology world, these questions come up repeatedly. And I know that independent of that, um, the things that I, boy, how to describe it? You know what? I'm, uh, this is a funny story. I'll, I'll tell it this way. One day, this is about 25, 26 years ago, my wife and I were, were visiting a friend of ours. Um, that part's totally irrelevant, so I don't know why I said that. But anyway, um, for the umpteenth time, I heard someone say, tell a story, that there was a study of graduates of the 1954 class of Yale, and they looked at these people 30 years later and found that 3% of these people were more successful than the other 97% combined. And the only difference between them was that that 3% had written down their goals. Mm. And um, I'd heard this quoted repeatedly. Sometimes it was Harvard. Sometimes it was Princeton. Sometimes it was Yale. Sometimes it was 1954, 1968. It was all these different things. And I remembered the first person who ever told me this, who was a clinical psychologist and very good researcher. So I called him. And I said, do you have the study? And he said, no. And I said, that's because it's bullshit. I mean, I could just feel it. And then I even made a spreadsheet to determine how likely it was that this was even possible. And ironically, very likely, but only because, not because of the writing on your goals, but only because in any one of those classes at any one of those Ivy League universities, there's a decent chance that the son of the sultan of somewhere or other is in that class, and he's richer than everybody else combined already. So it just didn't ring a bell. So this is, again, a long time ago. I posted online somewhere, I don't even remember where, that I would pay someone $1,000 if they could give me the study. And I'd also pay $1,000 if they could prove that it never happened, even though you can't really prove a negative. Five minutes later, the guy who uh, started Snopes.com, which is a mythology evaluating website, often debunking, emailed me and said, here's an article where someone tried to track this down and they came to the conclusion that it was completely made up. And I said, Jesus, you, you had the answer so quickly. I feel a little anxious about giving you a thousand dollars. He said, I never expected you were going to give me anything. I said, okay, here's 500 bucks then. <laughs> but that moment was a turning point in just my psychology where I became hyper aware of how to listen to certain kinds of stories and, and almost immediately, almost with a knee jerk reaction, look to see if the opposite of that A, a leads to B story could be true, mm -hmm. or if there could be other causes that lead to B that are as or more likely than A leading to B. And when it came to footwear, it couldn't have been more obvious instantly. Um, you know, this whole thing that happens, 
some runner, like the best marathoner in the world, puts on a new pair of shoes and wins his next race like he would have anyway. But then everyone switches to those shoes just in case. Uh, and, you know, and it's all not true. And I'm a former All-American gymnast, so I know there's a lot of mythology in sports to begin with. But the other thing with uh, athletics and footwear is so that guy wins a race and then all these weekend warrior runners buy that shoe. Well, how does that make any sense? That guy was a 105 pound Kenyan who runs for 13 miles an hour for two hours straight. You're a 250 pound guy who runs five miles a week. Uh, and why do you think that the shoe he wears has anything to do with what's going to be good for you? And of course, punchline, Elliot Kipchoge, the guy who ran the sub two hour marathon under perfect conditions in a magic shoe from Nike, uh, he put out an, there was an article quoting him, came out a couple of years ago with him saying very loudly, it wasn't the shoes, it was my legs, but people still go buy the shoes. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's like, you're not that guy, you know, like so on the business side, somebody said to me, Hey, do you want to go to Richard Branson's Island and hang out with Richard? And I said, and they wanted to charge a bunch of money for this. I said, why would I do that? They were stunned. They said, well, imagine what you could learn from Richard. I said, oh, I can tell you everything I would learn from Richard. Oh, really? What's that? Okay, here it is in a sentence. I am not Richard Branson. Whatever he did, no one else has ever done it since. So clearly they can't do it. That's because they're not Richard Branson either. So, I mean, he might be a fun guy to hang out with, but what am I going to learn from him? Lots to unpack there, Stephen. <laughs> well, you know, and let me be a little clear. I may learn something from him, but is it something that I can do? Because I don't have his psychology. He doesn't have my psychology. And that's everything we do is based on what we believe in therefore, and what we think. And, um, and you can't just arbitrarily change your behavior uh, and expect to get the same results. Look, Richard Branson isn't even Richard Branson. In other words, if he had to start from scratch today, he couldn't do it. The universe has changed. Those opportunities are no longer there. They have, the, the world has moved on. So it's, you know, people loved it. Human beings, we're wired to imagine what we think it's going to take to make us happy and then try to find some way of getting there. It's just that we're really bad at imagining what it's going to take to make us happy. We're even worse at forgetting how bad we are or we're better at forgetting how bad we are. And um, we're, we're typically wrong. And we think that um, we can just reproduce what someone else did and maybe get there, but no one has ever done that reliably. You know, like the whole 10,000 hour rule, which is not true at all, but for people who don't know, the premise is that um, to become an expert in something, you need to spend 10,000 hours doing it. Well, there are a lot of people who spent 10,000 hours doing something and they do not become experts. But also, what kind of person is it who wants to spend 10,000 hours doing something? And what's the thing you're looking to do? When I first heard about this 10,000 hour rule, my immediate response was complete nonsense because the two biggest things that I've done in my life, actually three, diving, springboard diving, gymnastics, track and field. It's literally not possible to put in 10,000 hours before your career is over. Interesting. I want to go back to what you were saying about Richard Branson because I think that's a good way of running up to my next question. And I was thinking about how to formulate this. I think it's very hard to disagree with how important timing is for certain people. Yeah. Richard is one example. And I'm thinking about the brand and where it is now. And we've been talking a lot about belief and changing those beliefs in this episode. Do you think now is the time for more people to challenge that traditionally held narrative about footwear and you were the person to lead that forefront? There's always two movements in play. The people who are three, the people who are trying to maintain the status quo, the people who are trying to buck, buck the status quo, and the people who are, uh, or let me say it a little differently. There's always people who are trying to challenge things, but then there's inertia from the people who believe uh, in the status quo. And what really happens over time is if the people who are trying to maintain the status quo, if they start getting enough information in a small community, not from some celebrity influencer, 
but from people that they know and like and trust because they have a long history with him, then they eventually may try something. And when that small community adopts something new, people in that community are connected to other small communities. And that's how things actually spread. So we're, um, I've been commenting lately, we've been trying to raise some capital. And one of the things that people who have money that want to know is, am I riding a trend or not? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, here's what I can tell you. If you do, if you look in Google, in Google trends and look at the uh, search volume for the term barefoot shoes, it has grown worldwide. It's now at the highest level it's ever been. Secondly, there are more new minimalist brands uh, coming up almost every month now. It's been accelerating the growth of new minimalist brands. Obviously, our growth, we, we're growing significantly year over year, and a couple of the other brands that have been around for a while are doing the same. Um, so now is, on the one hand, a good time because there's more interest. Um, but you're going to have to do something that's unique enough to deal with the fact that between uh, Vivo Barefoot and Zero Shoes, we dominate the market. And to be able to do anything about that is challenging because A, uh, we're much, that much bigger and so we have more resources. And B, we're seen as authentic because we've been doing it for a very long time. So to come in with something new and be the upstart, um, it's a little tricky, but that doesn't you know, mean not do it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm all for competition. It just proves the concept more and more. As more people start hearing about it from more places, the tide is raised for everybody. Stephen, this has been a fascinating conversation. I had so many more questions. I think what I would love to ask you now is where can our listeners go to learn more about Zero Shoes? Depends on where you are on the planet. So um, there are the, there's three websites that are uh, that you want to check out: zeroshoes.com for basically everywhere other than these next two websites: zeroshoes.co.uk if you're in the UK, and zeroshoes.eu if you're in the EU. And if you're not in any of those places, zeroshoes.com. And if you go to any of those websites, in the upper right-hand corner is a link to find the stores that are carrying our products. None of the stores are carrying all of our products, but you can find some stores, hopefully locally. And we're getting more stores carrying zero shoes literally every day. Uh, and that's really going to accelerate by the end of this year and, the and going into 2024. Um, and of course, then you can find us on social media at zero shoes or slash zero shoes or at zero shoes EU or slash zero shoes EU. We haven't really gotten everything rolling for the UK yet, um, but uh, you'll find us on social media as well. Perfect. Well, we'll put all those links in the show notes. And Stephen, I want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today and all the best in the future with Zero Shoes. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.